personal finance expert and MeVest founder, Leslie Ann Scorgi, joining us on Canada Now. And Leslie Ann, your newest article in The Star discusses how to master the budgeting process without an app or a fancy spreadsheet. Let's face it, a lot of people are allergic to templates and apps and spreadsheets, and that's okay. But what is not great is if those people just don't budget at all. So what I was focused on in my most recent column was how do you budget if you're one of those people who is not inclined to keep a really tight rope on your budget? And so there's this rule that is, I think, pretty effective. It's, yes, a little bit more loose, but it still will help you achieve uh, budgeting uh, at a higher level. So it's like a 30,000 foot budgeting approach versus the the day-to-day really nitty gritties that some people like to do. So the rule is called the 50 30, 20 rule. And what it says is that there's three categories of your money going to different places. 50% goes towards your needs, 30% towards your wants, and 20% towards your savings. So that's the rule, nice and simple. And I think that if you're not like a, a math person, that should still make pretty good sense. <laughs> <laughs> no, you, you, you broke it down so I can understand it, which means everybody <laughs> can understand it. So I appreciate that. And so does everybody else. And to implement this system, there are three steps that you recommend. Firstly, review your costs and find those opportunities to save. That's right. And honestly, if you're math inclined or not, this is a great thing to do anyway. So the first thing is you do want to go and have a look at what's running through your accounts every month. Are you subscribed to services that you're not actually using? Are there opportunities for you to negotiate your internet, cable, um, all of those kinds of bills? Even going so far to, to be methodical around like reviewing your visa or MasterCard statements, because you know this, uh, during the pandemic, a lot of us signed up for entertainment services and like really small little things to make life more interesting. Well, guess what? All those subscriptions, they could be hundreds of dollars of tiny little, tiny little costs. So all of that, it's under review. I had a student very recently who did this exact thing and she found $300 of subscriptions she wasn't using on a monthly basis. So what she's done is canceled all of that and created um, an a transfer from her checking account into her savings for the exact same amount, $300 that she can automatically start Perfect. saving. Perfect. Yeah. Oh yeah. Like with, with my credit card statement, I, I go through it with a fine tooth comb. I even go, I, I even go to the extent of getting a calculator out and adding up all of, all, all of, uh, you know, what I've been billed for to make sure that the math is right. I totally. even do that because I want to make sure I, you know, because you don't pay a bill and go, all right, well, I'll take their word for it. No, no, no. There's nobody <laughs> else that's going to do what I'm going to do. So you you, you got to take that step. Uh, speaking of steps, second one here uh, to implement this 50, 30, 20 rule is to automate uh, wherever you can. You, you kind of touched on it there. So it's like creating a system. And I always coach my students on this. Automations are your friend. So Yes, you might not be inclined to use an app, and I'm okay with that, but automations, doing the work to have, let's say, pre-authorized debits set up for your bank account, for all your utility bills, even to pay off your credit card total in, in total each month, all of that can be automated. What I also love to suggest is that while you're at it, automate some automatic savings. So savings for your child's RESP, maybe for your own RRSP, tax-free savings account, even into your emergency fund. So think of it it like conducting an orchestra. Uh, You're automating everything. So queuing different sections of the orchestra to do the work and make their particular sound at a certain time so that 
as you pull your finances together, that uh, that orchestra is is really sounding quite good and kind of going off, off without a hitch. I love that. I, I love that. And the third step is uh, to take a look at this new budgeting system that you have here and to find out if it's actually working for you. Progress, right? We're all in this to make progress. So one of the ways to measure whether or not you are making progress is net worth tracking. So if your budget is actually working for you, that system you set up is, is doing what it should be doing, your net worth should be going up every month. If it's decreasing, there are a couple of things that it could be related to. Number one, your system that you just set up is, is broken somewhere along the way. So go back and check that or behavior is broken. And behavior would be things like bad habits, overspending, forgetting to pay your bills. Like that's, that's a broken system. And so you want to just make sure that you're monitoring your net worth, that it's going up every month. If it's not, uh, head on back and, and do a review. So how long does it take, Leslie Ann, for you to, to really see the benefits of your budgeting? About 90 days. And mm, okay. with that, so be patient. It's not going to be an overnight thing. You'll see some immediate results right away. But really that long-term system, 90 days, and you will start to feel like you have more efficiency and more money in your hands. Mm. So uh, another recent article of yours, um, Leslie Ann, discusses how to find the right advisor for you. And I don't know if I'm in the majority here, but I, I found that, you know, early on um, in, um, in my life, you know, and getting out on my own and becoming a homeowner for the first time, you know, you find it all very overwhelming. And then when you find um, a, an advisor, you're, you're basically just trying to find anybody that can help you. But I totally. love the way you take this approach in your article. It's like, no, 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 you're hiring them to work for you. This is a job interview. And, and I love the way you've laid it out here. It's a power dynamic shift. So you know me, I'm all about the people. Put power <laughs> back into the hands of the investor. So you as an investor, doesn't matter how much you have, you should be focused on interviewing the advisor that's going to be the right fit for you. Not the other way around, begging them to take you on. Like it used to be like that. And that's wrong. So one of the first things that you should do in your interview process is do a background check on that advisor. So background checks are about credentials and what associations are they governed by? So for example, I have my securities licenses. Someone who chooses to work with me should ask me that question. Leslie Ann, did you do the Canadian Securities Institute securities licenses? Or Leslie Ann, where, what kind of courses and what kind of education do you have that makes you qualified to be giving me advice? Those are questions that are super helpful for you to know that the person that you're asking to get advice from is qualified. And I just need to say one more thing here. Yeah. With the rise of social media and all of the loud voices out there around financial advice, what I have seen is a, a huge amount of unqualified voices in the market. These are folks who are really interested in personal finances, but they actually don't have credentials. So be really, really careful. Who are you taking advice from? It's good that you point that out. Uh, absolutely. Because, you know, let's face it, a lot of times we might be scrolling along social media uh, in a state where we're not um, um, fully capacitated. You know, maybe it's yeah. it's late at night and you read something that really kind of lands with you, but you're not thinking straight and maybe you're kind of tired and you're just taking someone's word at face value. So I'm glad you you bring that up. You also talk about in the article about asking about what their investment strategy would be for you? Like what would their philosophy be in managing your money? Right, and this is where they should have what's called a know your client questionnaire on intake. And that helps them understand how comfortable you are with risk and also what your goals are. So that's key. One size does not fit all when it comes to investing. And so you'll also wanna ask them about their strategy when it comes to 
your money. How much is going to go into an RSP or a tax-free savings account? Maybe something that's non-registered. Get them to give you some opinions on that. They are going to have opinions there. That's very helpful. And of course, you know, with everything that is going on in the world right now, you will want to ask them one additional question, which is how will they plan to either include or not include global investments? What's, what's their take on what's happening in the world globally? Get that question nice and cleared up. Mm, yeah. And, you know, hopefully your money is, is going to grow and you point out, hey, ask them about what, uh, what their advice is going to be uh, and what their strategy is going to be as your money grows. And how are they on financial reviews as well? Totally. So do they call you once a year? Do they call you every month? <laughs> when are they going to sit down and go through everything? So I like to, at a minimum, recommend one or two times a year you're having a comprehensive review but you really should be hearing from this professional on a monthly basis. So it could be a newsletter, could be an email, could be a phone call, depends on the style and, and how you uh, want that relationship to go. Even if you decide to go with like a robo advisor, you should be hearing from them on a monthly basis at a minimum and a comprehensive review one to two times per year. The other thing that I think is really important, especially as um, you grow uh, with your age and as your family grows, do find out if this person or this service has other financial services like estate planning. Do they have guidance on wills? Uh, that's going to be helpful. Insurance, that will be really helpful for you to kind of see if they're more like a 360 service or if it's just investing. That's right, because those uh, services often by the customer get lost and get forgotten. So totally. it's good. To, it's good to have somebody working for you that's actually going to remind you of those things as well. And, uh, you know, maybe you could update those as you go along. Um, what about and, and you mentioned it there, I wanted to ask you about uh, contacting someone if you're just not happy with the direction you're going in, like, how would they feel about I want to talk to your boss? Yeah. And I think uh, what you're talking about is like, I got a problem. What are we going to do? No. Right. The best relationships in the world are kind of predefined because they have a framework to work through challenges like a marriage, right? <laughs> you set up, <laughs> you set up the, um, the framework in advance and say, Hey, honey, if you've got a problem, I want you to talk to me first. And then maybe we'll seek some counseling or something like that. So, um, you should ask, how are we going to resolve our, our differences? And usually the advisor will ask you to come to you to them first, see if you can resolve it and then have an escalation path. So do I talk to your boss? Do I talk to an office of the ombuds person? Uh, and, and where are those contact details? All of that should be predefined right up front. And ask like what the fees are, like, is this going to cost me? Like, and, and what do they depend on? Right. Hot topic right now, right? You yeah. see a, a splash across again, social media on TV, all of the advertisements that are coming down really hard on high fees. So what are you going to pay for this person to, or this service to, to take care of your investments? Obviously what we are, what we all need to know is that this service does cost money. What kind of value are you going to get for that money? Gone are the days where you can have kind of a lazy advisor who's collecting the highest fee and not doing much. Mm -mm, that's all gone. So find out, are they commission-based? Are they fee-based? Are they um, a, what they call assets under management, a percentage of that? Find out how they're compensated and sit with it. Do you like that approach or do you want to go a, a different approach where they only get paid if they're doing work? And you also remind us, uh, kind of getting back to this uh, job interview style that we have here, is to ask for references. And if they check off all these boxes, references included, if, if they check off all the, the boxes and you're happy with the answers, move forward. Because at some point, you have to trust somebody. 
You do. Again, I point to what it's like in a relationship. You do need to make yourself comfortable enough with the person where you can open that relationship and start to build trust. This person is on your dream team, your financial dream team for a while. So get familiar with them. Uh, do that reference check as your last step and, and don't be afraid to, to really drill in. Is this person yeah. right for you? It is like a job interview. This person's going to be with you for a very long time. So make sure you like them. Oh, for sure. Check out MeVest.ca, personal finance expert, MeVest founder, Hank and Dot's mom, Leslie Ann Scorgi. Leslie Ann, always a pleasure, my friend. We'll do it again next week. Thanks, Jeff.